to realistic hazard levels prior to the big one or once uh, requires us to use the best available information and simulations uh, and simulations are the next best to actual observations, all power to peer to push this into practice. Thank you, Swami. Uh, thanks, Khalid. I, I was just uh, having my very late dinner, thanks to the conference. So I'm in the East Coast now. So uh, thanks for reading. By the time I got to the, to, 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 to the mic, it was too late. So thanks for really taking care of the comment. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a great comment. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see, I, I, I thought a, a, a few more slides to maybe um, elicit some discussion or, or to make a few more points uh, towards the end of the day here. And you know, one of the things about a forum like this is, is we all get together and there's really great discussions um, and then there's not always follow on. And so, so I had had offline discussions with Peer uh, and some of the other uh, organizing committee members. And we came up with a, a few ideas about how we might begin to put this idea uh, beyond the confines of this particular workshop. And I just want to share those ideas with you for thought and discussion. Uh, number one, one potential tangible action going forward uh, would be the creation of a synthetic ground motion working group for performance-based earthquake engineering. Um, and this seems like something that and is something that the Peer Lifelines program uh, might have interest in. And, and I think there's a number of things that we discussed that, that might be valuable here. Number one, is to establish a clear picture of what constitutes success for utilization of synthetic ground motions uh, and how do we measure progress uh, towards that goal. And that's something we discussed. Uh, number two, develop a plan for characterization of uncertainty. Uh, number three, identify early compelling use cases to evaluate PBEE utility uh, for some early successes. And I think Farhang just described one uh, simulation and then simulation could shed some light on the classical assumptions of vertically propagating waves. Uh, so that would be useful. Uh, identify and promote performance-based earthquake engineering requirements to the earth science community and to reach back. And, and I think if we recall early in this uh, meeting, Rob Graves made a very good point uh, when we started talking about the number of rupture scenarios we would need to characterize risk. He said, we need more feedback uh, from the engineering community about what parameters are causing the damage to their structures so we can link that to our, our understanding of parameters and our rupture models and so forth. So that would be an important function. Uh, then I think what we just talked about is promote accessibility to appropriately vetted synthetic motions. Um, I think that's really, really important and we see that uh, from the response of the community. And then there, there could be a, a element of this working group to communicate the status of synthetic ground motions uh, for performance-based earthquake, uh, performance earthquake engineering in an unbiased way to the stakeholder communities. And, and much as Peer did with uh, performance-based design, they could carry this message uh, out to the stakeholder communities. So that was a, a dialogue that we've had. Um, so um, Norm or, or Holly, would you like to comment on the interest in this type of a, an organiz a, a working group going forward? Well, I, I'll certainly let Norm chime in. Uh, I think having a working group as such is very important. Having this done under Norm's leadership, since he is the director of the Lifeline now, uh, is, is the right thing to do. Hopefully he's willing to do that. And uh, Pierre will do everything possible to make this happen. Uh, especially, I, I, I see from these polls that uh, at least this group of attendees supported the idea, which is very encouraging. I, I, I would need to, uh, if we're going to put resources into this, the, the proper course of action is I, I, I need to take the uh, outcome uh, or the resolution of this workshop to the research committee and, and let them uh, make a, a final decision on that and, and we proceed. Uh, that's a straightforward process. Norm or others, any thoughts on this? My main thought is we need to get started. Um, so I, I think getting a, a database of synthetic ground motions that we have reviewed is straightforward and can be done, you know, th this shouldn't be a working group that, you know, two years from now, we're still talking about how to get something happening. So 
my main issue is start, get something going. And I, I think this will grow as, once you start to give access to these motions and people can look at them. There's other comments about getting feedback, you know, from the community, like, are they easily accessible or searchable? They're, the databases are going to be bigger. It's not a few thousand motions. It's now, you know, a hundred thousand. So I think Morgan said they, they had cut SCEC down to 600,000 was it or something like that. For, so there's going to be a massive a problem of, of dealing with the size of the data that we need to address. But I would focus yeah. on making some progress, you know, in, in the next six months, not in the next two years. Yeah. So you, you led to my next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Let, um, me, let me say just one thing. I totally agree with you, Norm. And let's do the following. Let's say in the next peer annual meeting, January 2022, uh, let's take that as a deadline for us to present the beta version of uh, this uh, database. And yeah. then we seek input and we make improvement as, as yep. time goes by. That, yeah. that sounds like a good deadline and it, it's, it's doable. Yeah, so th that was my next slide. And this is something that we've obviously talked about as well is, is you know, our DOE funded project is generating synthetic ground motions. We would be more than happy to be a guinea pig uh, in sharing some of those motions with Pierre now, early on. And, and we actually have a new project from DOE from the Office of Energy Security that goes beyond our Exastail computing project and some funding to actually begin to transition uh, some of this technology into practice. And so we could uh, legitimately under that project uh, work with PEER to de deliver synthetic motions. Uh, I think the PEER project we heard about from Floriana and Norm are, are, would be a, a nice corollary to this. Uh, they're already developing four-part acceptance criteria to begin to apply. Uh, and that's in the early stages, obviously, but that is an investment that PEER's already been making that would tie right into this nicely. Uh, and so in my mind, it's uh, under number three, coming up with some of the schemas for how we compress, because uh, we compress all of our data uh, so that we reduce the size tremendously, and then you go and fetch it. And we've developed the tools for that compression and that fetching, uh, as well as linking uh, engineering codes, uh, as long as they're set up in the right reference frame with the ground motions from the, the ground motion simulation. So we would be uh, certainly interested in and willing to cooperate with Pierre on this activity. And I think it's something that could be done sooner rather than later, as Norm suggested. Any comments on that one? Okay, Norm had one more, and which is, I think, related, but it's, goes, it's a little bit different than the database. Uh, and that would be a ta tangible action of actually you know, piloting the first phase utilization of 3D simulations in a risk calculation. And, and Norm, you should talk a little bit about what you might envision here uh, in terms of, you know, dipping the toe in the water for this as well. And, and this, in, the, in the theme of, you know, not admiring the problem and getting busy and actually doing something. Right, so, so to, before we run risk, we need to run, be able to run hazard, right? So I, I would start with a, a, a focus on getting the, the data so that we can implement 3D simulations, the existing ones, into a hazard calculation. So bringing them into the ground motion model so we can actually run hazard and, and, and start there. I would then, as a second, the second step, start to run, run the, uh, the risk calculation. But... Uh, we're back to getting started and this this first thing needs to happen right is this to get this validation done i would start with the this the small magnitude events that are well recorded to demonstrate that the 3d velocity model is leading to improved predictions or no worse predictions than what we're using with our empirical models that has to happen before we can move anything to practice yeah. right so yeah. I think that's a, that's the first step. Um, I would like to see you know uh, something on the order of, of twenty small events modeled with the three D velocity model. While those data are used to derive the velocity models, it's mainly on uh, a lot of it's on timing, right? Seismologists work a lot with arrival times to adjust velocities. We're more interested in amplitudes and. 
they're related, but they're not always the exact same thing. So uh, we can accept errors in the timing as long as we get the amplitudes right. Mm -hmm. So um, if we could get a, let's say 20 earthquakes, small magnitude earthquakes that can be used to demonstrate the uh, improved predictive power or the predictive power of the existing 3D velocity model. Because my concern is that the velocity model may have enough limitations in it that it's not, you know, is it not making things better or at least in parts of the velocity model, it actually doesn't improve the, the fit. And so trying to figure that out uh, in terms of how we can find some areas to start to implement uh, working parts of the model and say, how would you get this into, into hazard? And how would, um, this would be a, um, a case to, to team up with pg e because they've got enough facilities that we can look at saying, how would this information improve our estimates of, of the hazard at their sites for a, a large number of facilities? And we could say it's improving it in this area. In another area, the velocity model isn't, isn't um, advanced enough to, to provide improvements. But that's how I'd like to get started so that we actually get something all the way to, to some uh, calculations. Great. And, and Morgan, does that, how does that fit with what you're thinking? On, on the well, I, so I mean, you're saying use the 3D simulations to validate the observations. I, I mean, I, it just seems to me like we've heard of a number of issues like characterizing the source of small magnitude earthquakes and so everything I, else. I, I certainly support the idea of, so of validating with- in the, in this phase one, we're not trying to get the amp, absolute level of the amplitude, but the path effects. Mm -hmm. So we can live with some mismatch with the source properties of the smaller events, as long as we're seeing the right spatial distribution of the path effects. Okay. Because remember that was going to basically take the GMPE and then say, we're going to adjust it for path effects from simulations, not jumping all the way to the amplitude from the simulations as a right. way to move this forward and get something we can use. Very similar to what you're doing with the 3D basin effects, mm -hmm. right? A, a little more broad than that, but, but similar in, 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 in scope as a way right. to move forward without jumping too far and having too many difficulties and then you get, you get nothing. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, our, our thinking is first just, you know, validate the, the basin scaling as kind of the most fundamental step and then look at the spatial variations in basin amplification from the simulations and, and try to validate that with small magnitude data. And yeah, so we're trying to jump to, I guess, that second step of, of the spatial variation. It, our, is the 3D velocity model in its current stage or form able to predict the spatial variations better than a model that, you know, that more accurately than just the regular old ground motion model? Right. Model out there, right? And, and we have to show that before I would use anything like this on the project. Yeah. I guess another advantage of the small events is that the model can be smaller. Okay. Can you speak up, Farhang, or get closer to your mic? Yes, I guess the advantage of a small event is that the model can be smaller. So we can run uh, quite a bit of it. Yeah, the source is smaller. The model may not be a lot smaller. The main advantage is we have data, right? <laughs> I think that's a fundamental thing because we need data to, to validate. And that's where our, the most of our data with the spatial coverage we're after is going gonna, is gonna to come from smaller events. Mm -hmm. I do not have a fee for how long does it take, uh, for, for example, this model for the area was shown. Is it a day run or a month run? Or? I'm sorry, repeat again. I'm asking about the computer time uh, day for running a say, Bay Area model. Oh, well, well, we can run the Bay Area at 10 hertz in just under seven hours right now. Oh, that's With a good. Of, you know, we, we've really, you know, we've tried to not only increase our frequency resolution, but make sure we can run these models fast for this very reason. So we can run 10 Hertz at, at, with a V sub S min of 500 meters per second in six hours and umpity ump minutes. Very good. And we can run, a, obviously we can run a five Hertz simulation much more rapidly, but 
Um, I do agree with Norm. I think we need to go step by step and we need to correlate with the recorded motion uh, to the extent possible. Uh, but on the uh, obviously expected close match, but it has to be reasonable. Uh, and see what else can be done to the model to, to, to calibrate. Any other thoughts on this topic? So I guess I, I still not clear. Does the working group sound right to help move this forward? Thinking of actionable items. Seems like the working yeah, group I, I, can plan I the want the working group to actually work in an efficient way, yeah. right? Well, we're, not, we're, not just be a bunch of meetings, right? Yeah, we're we're presuming the working group would do something. <laughs> That's a boundary condition. <laughs> working group, working group, which works fast. Yeah. I, appreciate, I appreciate the sense of urgency. That's why we're having this discussion. Well, the 10 years from now, we're not still talking about what are we going to do to advance the practice. Yeah, but, 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 but part of getting things done in a quick way is not depending on a whole lot of volunteers. Yeah. yeah. Right. So we have to find some way to get adequate funding for people that are involved in, in, in these working groups yeah. and so forth. So. Well, so I, I'll make the point again, we have DOE funding to cover our activities for advancement to practice. So we, we have some funding that some effort we can put against this. So and we'll, we would offer that as, as collateral uh, for any activity that PEER has. Okay, any questions, any additional questions on these topics from the audience? Sounds like there's an interest in aggressively moving forward. I just have one more topic um as we thought about this and i've i've raised this with with norman holland a couple of times is you know as of right now the ability to execute uh these types of simulations is kind of held within the research community to some degree and, and i think it would be useful for the longer term to have a discussion about what does a sustainable operational model for regional scale simulations look like uh, and who does that i mean you, you know you're going to have to have a multidisciplinary team of people that develop consensus model inputs in some sense. You have to have high performance computing. Uh, you have to have data archiving community access. I think we have a solution for this potentially. We just talked about it at Peer, you know, but long-term who does this? Is it a national lab? Is it a university? Is it a nonprofit? Uh, is it a multi-institutional team? Uh, that, that vision is not clear in my mind. And uh, I always, I hate to bring up and admire problems without any suggestion for solution. But it seems to me that uh, over the long haul, this is something that needs to be thought about uh, because these simulations are, are going to have to be done in a way where the code is verified and validated to the degree possible, maybe even has some QA pedigree uh, because you're gonna be doing, you know, uh, calculations are gonna be uh, doing important things in a safety sense. So it's it just, in my mind, as we go forward and, and follow on from this meeting, there should be some thought and discussion about this uh, and, and what this model looks like going forward. You know, certainly the national labs and, and agencies like USGS have some capabilities uh, to run these things, uh, but is that the right model? I don't know, uh, but it seems to me there should be some discussion about how some of this technology can be leveraged and transferred into a model that can do these efficiently and, and reliably, not in a research sense, uh, but in a production sense, um, and QA and, and store and archive the motions very reliably. So it just seems to me this is another future topic for the longer term to have a discussion about. Okay. David, can I ask a question about this? I mean, is your, your vision for this um, use case that there's an existing velocity model? Because that's, you know, obviously a yeah. huge part of this whole yeah, effort you know, that is it just you know continuous effort almost yeah i i absolutely agree and, and the velocity model is what it is right and we, we heard this this week that there's some improvements but there's no immediate plan for some of those improvements getting in right mm -hmm. and so to me part of that discussion and strategy is you know what do you do about that uh you know to increase the frequency of these simulations do you do you, you know, stochastic geology inclusion maybe helps a little bit, maybe some inversions. I don't know, but that's got to be part of the overall discussion, clearly. Uh, but a, a sustainable uh, a plan to regularly update the velocity models 
yeah. needs to be there as opposed to funding an individual researcher and saying, let me know what, when you have something, right? It's, it's, it's gotta be more organized than that. With, well, like the, your building code maps, you know, there ought to be either a three year or some cycle for updates on the velocity model that considers all of the validations that have been done in the meantime and new data that have been collected. But um, I think less than three years may be too infrequent for something like this, at least at this point. I think improvements can clearly be made and I wouldn't wanna be stuck with the velocity model that we know is, is having problems in an area and say, sorry, it's gonna be 10 years before you get a new one. But that, I think that's part of this bigger plan of something that will actually live on, you know, and, and how, so, so how do you make a, a, a model have, have periodic inputs or uh, updates that are using like, like the GS uh, best science at the time and trying to keep in, improving that as we go along. And, and I think in my mind, Norm, uh, just like any, you know, any sort of, of control, you would have change control process, right? Right, yeah. You know, you just wouldn't have individual researchers willy-nilly tweaking with the velocity model. You would have a, a baseline model that everybody knows that is there. It's version 1.1.0, and there's a very deliberate process for updating that model. So, so the, the SCEC community velocity models, are, you know, are a, a good, yeah, yeah. Um, platform to follow, I mean, a plan to follow. They've done a very good job of, of, of updating things, but with careful version control, and that's what really needs to happen. Yeah, you know, to my mind, maybe what's a little different here is, you know, the, the broad engineering participation in this, uh, so that it, whatever pops out on the back end is, is well tailored to performance-based earthquake engineering. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's a, maybe a new part of the dialogue here. So I think this will, it's unlikely that we'll get to in, in, in five years that on a project people will come to peer and say, I'm going to run 3D simulations for my site. But is that what you're expecting or thinking as no. opposed to researchers well, using I this? think people will come to peer for the data. Okay. Uh, my question is in a sustained fashion, who's going to be doing the analysis and running it? In right. That, right. Okay. Generating That's, more simulations. Generating right. more simulations. I mean, that, again, that could be a national, you know, the, the labs are really good at high performance computing and they have tremendous resources. You know, maybe that's part of the part of the equation, but it just, to me, to make this a sustained foundation for hazard and risk assessment, you have to think about these operational issues and, and uh, otherwise you're just gonna have little one-off things going on and it's, it's not gonna be a critical mass or a sustainable effort. So I'm just raising this issue. I, again, I hate to raise and, and admire the problem <laughs> so without a solution, but, mm -hmm. but I think it's it's worth you know raising this issue with the community. It seems it seems to me that engaging the labs is is a very is is necessary for that sustainable operational model. Whether the labs. Uh, have the interest to carry out all the research details. Uh, that's a question. Well, it's, uh, the labs would have the interest. The question is, is would DOE be a sustainable funding source? And you know, we've been we've been quite lucky in getting strong support from DOE. There's a possibility if the arguments made correctly and strategically. You know, so they, there is another issue I remember. Uh, the lab can do a great job. Uh, they have done other programs, as you know, a uh, number of labs. But industry coming to the lab often runs to a lot of critical contractual issues. Yep. And the fact whether a lab can work on a commercial project or not is not very clear. Uh, so access to that will be difficult. Yeah, I don't think that's the role for the labs if the lab are part of this. I think the role for the labs is is working with governmental other governmental agencies and and nonprofits, uh, you know, to make something like this work. And that, that would be the the most logical way for to engage the labs, um, because you're right. There's the there's the basic improvements um, that need to be happening right on the models. Yep. And and running new sets of simulations and creating them. 
I, I think the, um, you know, engineering project that comes and says, run them for my particular case, is going to be a different kind of a model. Here, right? That's a different model. Absolutely. Yeah. But if it's, if it's, for example, let's just say, if it's for running the Bay Area for the greater good, you know, and updating uh, hazard calculations for the Bay Area, that would be something that would be, you know, potentially doable. Without conflict or or huge effort. So, so anyway, I, I don't have a good answer for this. I think it's important. I think it's an important part of the long term discussion, uh, and it's you know this is not as on the critical path as as some of the other things that we talked about just a few moments ago. This and this, um, you know, and this, but it is an issue to at least think about in my mind. Jeff, are there any other comments you want to make if you're still with us, Jeff Bachuber, uh, along these lines? Yep, how's it going? Um, not really. Uh, as we have been, we are really interested to keep promoting this. As I mentioned, it's a kind of a long term down the road where we can really start to implement it reasonably, I think. And to Norm's point, you know, I think we still do have to bring along the regulators. Mm -hmm. um, but pg and &E on our side is willing to keep, you know, supporting this, looking at the long-term benefit we'll get from it. Okay. Holland, I've expired my slides. Yeah. Uh, I lost you for a second, David. I said, I've expired my slides that we talked about. So I'm, I think I'm done. <laughs> okay. I just yeah, want I, 